Good afternoon. This is your new Pan-African show called Africa, and your host is Alor Xhefu. Today we have a rather different uh, guest for you, and I will ask her to introduce herself. Welcome to Africa. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. My name is Heranta Dessa. That is my birth name. Um, I was adopted. I was born here, then went to the Netherlands, where even my name was changed. So officially, my name is Herane Broos. Okay. Um, but uh, Heran Tadesse, that's how everybody knows me here in Ethiopia. And I moved back 12 years ago. So what does Heran do? I know you wear quite a lot of different hats. So just describe all the things that you do, and then we can get into the serious questions. In the Netherlands, I studied tropical forestry. So I'm an engineer, I'm an environmentalist. And when I moved back here, my first job was with Addis Ababa University. So I was working under the Horn Regreening program. There used to be a program that was funded by the Dutch Embassy, the Horn of Africa Regional Environment Center and Network. They still have an office in the Gulele Botanical Garden. Okay. So I was working with them for a couple of years really supporting local initiatives that are actively doing things in the environmental sector here. Um, until I got my children, I got <laughs> married and um, with small children and breastfeeding, I didn't want to be in the office full time. So I switched and got into doing different part-time gigs. So one of those things is teaching yoga. I'm a breastfeeding counselor, so I also help other mothers when they have problems with breastfeeding. There is the Regina Family Center that we founded eight years ago, where there is a Waldorf-inspired daycare and different family activities. When you say Waldorf, can you explain Waldorf for some people? That sure, yes. Know? Waldorf is, some people know Montessori better, mm. but it's a type of curriculum where the development of the child is central and we allow them to develop at their own pace. Okay. So we don't put a lot of I academic pressure on small children, but instead allow them to play outside. We have stables, they ride horse, they into gardening, they bake bread. So for them to develop their life skills and then their social, their emotional intelligence, to spend a lot of time in free play. And then from there, once they have built that confidence and a sense of self, when they go into a kindergarten, they can learn the ABCDs quite easily. Um, but like it's done, for example, in Europe, in Finland, they only start introducing the letters when the children have changed their milk teeth. Mm. So it's a different concept of, um, instead of trying to force certain knowledge on children when they're not developmentally ready mm -hmm. to deal with things that they cannot touch. So when children are young, they just want to put everything in their mouth. Right. That's their stage of development. And as they outgrow that, they can deal with more intangible concepts. Mm. But initially it makes sense that everything they do is hands-on to build their confidence from there and then go into stories and go into writing and reading from there. Um, so that's basically also what we did with our children. They were uh, at the Regina Family Center and then we continued. After trying a couple of schools, we continued with homeschooling. I was, I was actually going to ask you after growing up or after being introduced to such a beautiful system, going into whatever school is available in Ethiopia, uh, is, it, is it balanced? You know, after learning such free, I don't even know how to describe it, but going into like a regular school, wouldn't that damage these children? Or isn't it too harsh on them? Yes, it's quite challenging. Um, like our early childhood education really allows them to be free and to be themselves. Whereas 
in most school systems, it already starts with the uniform. Like self-expression is really nulled down. And um, yeah, I mean, some schools may be better than others. We also, of course, deal with a budget issue because international schools are mm. ridiculously expensive. And where I grew up in the Netherlands, like education is kind of formalized, standardized. Um, you won't have teachers beating or insulting children mm. like it's just not done uh, here it still happens in some schools mm. so it's it's hard that's why um that's why i'm homeschooling because in the end i believe they need a certain uh, level of knowledge yeah. but it shouldn't in essence take from who they are and um so explain the benefits the, the advantages and the disadvantages of homeschooling, since we're on homeschooling. Okay. One of the big advantages is that the children live stress-free. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have to rush early morning, get in traffic, um, wear masks all day and wear uniforms and only speak when spoken to. Um, it's quite different when they're in our home settings. So I used to have a tutor where they get the major subjects. So it's important that they learn how to read and write really well uh, and basic maths and everything else you can take from there. Every subject, like once you read well, you can learn about it. You can educate yourself. Um, there is the Bingham School that offers homeschooling support. So they have a library, they have different curricula and they also test the children at the end of the year. So that is an avenue that would be like a backbone to the homeschooling because if they get tested, they have a result. With that result, they could enter any school, basically. The other benefit is that the child gets to explore what they love and develop what they love more. Um, there are so many things that I remember, even from my own education, that I never used mm -hmm. now, practically. Um, it seems that in general, the world is changing and even education is changing. In many countries, homeschooling is becoming more acceptable and there's a lot of online support as well. So the aim is that these children grow into responsible adults and live their life happily. So with that, it helps if they can explore what they love more. And that could only happen in the house. Freely. Freely, yes, 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 yes. And it school, depends on the school. Yeah, yeah. Um, One of my questions was about your experience on the horn regreening program. And since you mentioned that as one of your experience, instead of me jumping later, we can just start from there. Start from there. <laughs> yes. So I came here 2010 um, with a program from the Netherlands that. Uh, allowed me to work at the university, coordinate this program. And it was really interesting because we have a lot of good initiatives in the country. Mm -hmm. um, the part of the job that I loved most was actually going out into the fields. So I've been able to visit different parts of the country like Beni Shangul, uh, Harar, Yerga uh, Chefe, where we have the best coffee in the world coming from. So it was a really enriching experience. And that was just when you moved, right? Right. That's beautiful. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, it just changed that after I had my children, I didn't really want to go into the field like two, three weeks. I didn't want to leave them. And then I'm also not really the person to have an office job, to just sit behind the computer all day. Um, I'm just too creative for that. <laughs> yeah, we can see. So <laughs> that's when I kind of changed and shifted my career. Although I have this strong affinity for nature conservation, it's not something you can do part time easily. No. So it was a good experience. It was obviously. a great experience. More or less, you discovered <clears throat> your country, you learned about, you know, that's a good one. I know you are an art lover. I wanted to ask about. Ethiopia's art scene, how, I mean, I know you've been here for a very long time, but during those times, I have personally have seen a lot of different changes. So could you describe how you felt about our art scene when you first got here? 
and then gradually how we've grown or how we've changed, how it's benefited our country, if it has, all of that beautiful <laughs> questions that we all yes. want. Well, when I just moved here, um, I married an artist. Okay. So through him, I got introduced to a lot of painters. Mm. Um, and I feel like it's, it's kind of different pockets, different bubbles. So you have a whole community of painters mm -hmm. that gather and meet whenever there's an exhibition opening and they do different group works together. And then there's a whole network of poets and writers. Uh, and then we have the musicians, exactly. as I have observed when it comes to the art scene. So we have the painters, the visual artists. We used to meet and gather whenever we have exhibition openings and closings, events. There is a whole scene, music scene, that is also huge and evolving. Then me personally, I'm more creating poetry, so the whole poet scene and the events around that. What I have seen over the years is that there have been good initiatives, but I don't feel like art is getting the credit and the value that it should in this country. So for example, um, there used to be Netza Art Village. Uh, it may come back or not. Gura uh, Maile, they may reestablish somewhere else or not. The sustainability mm. is an issue, I would say. Uh, it's not easy for any artist to live off of their arts, but even the fact that there is not a proper hub where this, heart, this art can grow and evolve um, is not in our benefit. What I'm happy about is that we have strong communities. So people support each other and the art is ever evolving. I love the fact that you could see more of an African identity. Mm -hmm in our arts coming up as well. Um, it's not so one-sided anymore. anymore. It's really more complex. And I, I enjoy the spectrum of what we have to offer. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay, so, so the other thing you, uh, you, you mentioned in introducing yourself was about the experience that you had with the Ethiopia, the Ethiopia deaf experience. How did you get in that? I know it's a volunteer work, but it's big of you to be doing something like that. So I would like to know how you got into it and what is it exactly that you help or do? So the Ethiopian Deaf Experience is a program under an organization called Duras for Development. And actually, when I first came to Ethiopia in 2010, it was with that organization that was funded by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands, because they wanted to get the diaspora out. Okay. So they were supporting us financially to resettle in our homelands. Home. So that was through Deras that I came wow. initially. And then... Um, Wait, I'm sorry. What they actually help diasporas, they fund you yes. so th that you could actually repatriate yes. back home. For, for a year, they gave us additional wow. funding monthly. So with that, I was able to support my life mm -hmm. and um, make that step because it's not easy. And when I first moved back, it wasn't with the whole concept of moving here permanently. But, you know, you fall in love and uh, you fall in love with your <laughs> country. <happen>. And, uh, <laughs> <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yes, so there is for development. I've always been kind of in touch. I, uh, I like the work that they do. And um, when I reconnected with them, there's just another level of fulfillment to work with different abled people. So we have some deaf actors that are break dancers, wow. which I find so amazing because they literally feel the beat. They feel the beat. Yeah. They don't hear it. They don't, but they feel the bass. Yes. Yeah. Um, so they are incredibly um, talented. Mm. Some of them, they teach theater at Sudiskilo University. So the, the actors that we work with, they raise awareness <gasps> around deafness. Mm. And in general, disability in this country it should not be seen as a curse anymore. 
Like we have to really change get our, past yeah. that, change the narrative and see what they can contribute. And they can contribute so much. There's so much we can learn from them. So we also work with disabled people that teach dance. So we put the people that are different able on a platform to teach us. So the deaf people, they teach us sign language, uh, an introduction to sign language in a very playful way. So they can also teach children, uh, visitors, anybody that's interested really. Uh, regular workshops happen at the Louvre Hotel. And with the, the spot, the sports teachers, the disabled sports teachers, they go into different schools in Addis Ababa and they teach not only children with a disability, but they teach the youth movement. Mm. And I think it's always inspiring when you see someone doing the impossible. I know. Um, that is. That's so inspiring. that it, 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 it fulfills me in a, in a unmatched level mm -hmm. because I am a forester. I love trees, but I love people more. And um, there is a lot that we can learn. From, yeah. Actually, you learn a lot about yourself, too, mm. when you open yourself to learning from disabled you know, people. So now let's go into your yoga. Mm. I know you're a yoga teacher. How and when did you get into yoga? Okay. When I was a university student in the Netherlands, that's where I studied nature, conservation and tropical forestry we had discounts to try out different sports mm. and that's when I tried yoga uh, which is 20 years ago and since the first class I felt this is something else this is for me this is like much bigger mm. than just an exercise right. so it really became my lifestyle um, I'm vegetarian I, I teach yoga. I've been teaching for nine years now in Addis Ababa at several different locations. I'm certified in three different styles of yoga. So Kemetic yoga, which is ancient Egyptian yoga, uh, African yoga, and also pre and postnatal yoga for pregnant women and couples. I think an essential part of me is a healer. So I love when I can contribute to people's well-being and wellness. There's nothing that, that makes me more happy. And so um, I work with different companies, go into their offices and teach their staff. Um, and I do events and we're setting up more group classes. My question would be when you, when you go into offices and you you actually teach the employees. Uh, why would you do that? And what's the benefit that, I mean, there's obviously a reason why you were called to actually even do that. So if you could talk about that. Sure, sure. One thing I realized that my main core motivation is always to have a positive impact in my country. Uh, the problem is not in the trees. Mm. It's in the way we feel and the way we think. Mm. So, especially people in certain positions, they can make a lot of changes for the good if they feel good. Right. Mm -hmm. So, when I teach, for example, architects, even though they are creative people, they sit behind a desk most of the time, they work on computers, on screens, and that creates tension in their shoulders, in their back, and even when we do a session just once a week, it helps them relief. Mm. It adds to a team building feeling. Um, and for me, like the way I teach really depends on who's there. So I check in with everybody before the class, also after the class on any specific issues that they like to work on. And it's, it's, it's quite different for someone that sits in a, behind a desk all day or like a stay at home mom. So I customize what I teach according to the need. And um, in offices, it's kind of similar because we sit on chairs. on chairs, which is actually a very unnatural 
<laughs> movement. Like yeah, this is very is. recently <laughs> that, you know, <laughs> and, and, and when you look at the history of humanity, like <laughs> sitting in chairs is something recent. Um, and so our bodies need counter positions so that the energy can flow. The better the energy can flow internally, the better we feel. Um, we often have different pains um, that we don't even pay attention to, but they are like microaggressions, like internally, it may just affect your mood. So when you feel refreshed, revitalized, well rested, um, it's easier to deal with the world and we can be better towards the people around us. That, that's really my main motivation. Mm. I love teaching women as well, especially pregnant women, because they carry new life. When they feel better and their babies feel better, you yeah, know, we're working. Feels <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. I know what you mean. It's very interesting and I actually like the fact that you even have people calling you from the office. Obviously, they're calling you. It's not like you're going soliciting people. Okay, can I? No. They called you to say, okay, we need you. So obviously, they know the benefits of what it is that you're giving them. Mm. So that in itself is a good thing. So yoga, especially kemetic yoga, is being... Uh, what's the word? Ethiopians are actually learning about it and I'm assuming you're the only one in Ethiopia that is actually doing Kemetic. So my next question would be what's the difference between Kemetic yoga and other forms of yoga? Sure, sure. Because you started <clears throat> with Hatha yoga, correct? Yes, when I was in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, a yeah. student. So I would also like to know how you switched into Kemetic, why you thought Kemetic was better than Hatha, if there's any difference at all. When I started yoga at the university, Hatha yoga was the only thing available at that point. It was 20 years ago. And I loved it. I really did. It was the only exercise where you're in a post, you struggle, and then you take time to relax and breathe. So it can actually incorporate into your being and really stimulate the healing process. So my, the type of yoga I teach is not power yoga. It's right. not like aerobics. The breath is fundamental. Mm. It's the same in Kemetic yoga. So what makes Kemetic yoga different is that the postures that we do are also on the temple walls. They're in the hieroglyphs. They're on the pyramids. And even here in Ethiopia, when you think of Takla Haimanot, for example, he stood on one leg, they say, for seven years. That's, that's yoga. That's yoga. Mm -hmm. um, so even Sigdet, mm -hmm. even the way Muslims pray, there is movement and prayer combined in our cultures already. It's just not been pointed out separately as yoga. Mm -hmm. And um, so Kemetic Yoga in particular, it links us to our ancestors.